Let's do another Cult Albums episode, shall we? Hey guys, welcome to Amity Tracks. We haven't done a Cult Albums episode in a while, so let's do it. As you probably remember from the other six episodes we've done in this series, uh, these are records that weren't really huge in the mainstream, but over time have developed loyal followings. You know, some of them you know, you've probably heard of, some of them maybe not. But uh, I'm going to do kind of a thematic one this time around, uh, mainly because I was inspired uh, when I recently picked up a used copy of uh, one of these records I'm going to feature today, and uh, kind of blown away by it. And I figured, you know, this would be kind of an interesting theme to carry throughout the uh, the episode. Which is, so all of these are records recorded by artists who were part of really big bands. But these are sort of side projects or solo albums after they left that band or were kicked out of that band or whatever. And so these are you know, by artists who were members of very well-known huge bands but not made with those bands. And so the whole record that inspired this episode that I was referring to earlier is Michael Nesmith. Michael Nesmith and the First National Band. The album is Loose Salute from 1970. Now, as most of you know, Michael Nesmith of the Monkees, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, if you, if you know a whole lot about Sort of the history of the monkeys and how they were put together and, and all of that. You probably also know that you know, members of the monkeys were you know increasingly frustrated over time because they wanted to assert their own artistic sensibilities, their songwriting, wanted to play their own instruments, all of that, and they met resistance from the powers that be. I, I think Michael Nesmith was probably the most frustrated of those of, of the members. Uh, because he, I think he had the most musical talent, you know, out of the four members in the Monkees. You know, and, and he had actually, you know, made a name for himself as a songwriter prior to the Monkees. He had, um, he had written a uh, different drum, uh, you know, which uh, you know, Linda Ronstadt, of course, uh, had a had a hit with. So he, he was already kind of a you know established songwriter at least. So you know, I I'd always heard about Michael Nesmith's solo albums and, and, you know, that they were pretty well respected, uh, you know, pioneering in some ways in the whole country rock genre, you know, along the lines of Graham Parsons or the Birds, and, you know, artists like that. And, you know, I, I kind of seen them here and there in some used bins, but they're you know, always a little pricey. And so, you know, I, I just never picked one up on a whim, but I, I saw this recently for a decent price. It's like, all right, I keep hearing that Nesmith stuff is pretty good. So I grabbed it. Love this. This is so good. I, I, I am super excited. I want to go hunt down, hunt down some of his other stuff. If you guys you know, maybe know more on Nesmith than I do, suggest you know, which one I should go to next in the comments. I, I would love to, to hear that. I did just stream the one that came before this, Magnetic South, uh, which I believe was re released in the same year. Is this 1970? And that was also excellent. I mean, I love that one. I want, I want to find that. Um, so, yeah, two out of two so far. So I'm super impressed with Michael Nesmith. You know, it, it's just this great combination of, you know, country, <laughs> right? You know, the country rock and, um, and uh, you know, great songwriting and great playing. I mean, these are these other guys he's got with him, especially the, the pedal steel player. Uh, let's see. Let me find it here. Yeah, Red Rhodes, right? OJ Red Rhodes on pedal steel guitar. Um, fantastic uh, on this and on uh, the on Magnetic South. I, mean, I haven't heard him on the the other stuff, but uh, yeah. So Michael Nesmith, but great band with him too. Just really good. Yeah, it's 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 this country, and then it's got these you know sort of the really good kind of catchy pop sensibilities that Nesmith possessed, 
mixing mixing those elements pretty seamlessly. You know, little tinges of the times. I mean, slight psychedelic tinges, not much at all, but just really and, and great songwriting. I mean, awesome songwriting. Nesmith, uh, you know, wrote uh, well every song on here except for he does a really interesting cover of "I Fall to Pieces." Uh, kind of country standard, but other than that, it's all you know original material from Nesmith. Fantastic. Uh, I, I should have jumped on this earlier based on the reputations, but I, I am going to keep my eyes open in the bins now for any future, you know, any Michael Nesmith records I can I can find. Okay, next one. Next one is not too obscure, but you know, I, you know, in some ways, you know, kind of one of those great cult artists, of course, talking about Sid Barrett, of course, of Pink Floyd, I mean, the original visionary in Pink Floyd before he kind of had a, had, you know, pretty severe mental issues, you know, how much, uh, you know, copious intake of drugs had to do with that is, you know, been discussed and debated. But this is his solo album after he was booted basically from Pink Floyd because he was non-functional. Um, the Madcap Laughs. The Madcap Laughs. And, uh, interesting album art, as you might expect. And this, so <laughs> one of the very few things David Gilmore and Roger Waters can ever agree on is that at least during his lifetime, Sid Barrett should have should be taken care of, and they made sure that royalties from Pink Floyd kept flowing to take care of, of their former bandmate, which is very admirable. Um, and this record is produced by David Gilmour and Roger Waters. <laughs> you know, so they really were trying to kind of help their their former bandmate because they, they really owed Pink Floyd to him. You know, he was the visionary in the beginning. The, the, I, I think this is a really interesting listen. I, I I don't love it as much as some people, but I, I really do like it a lot. It's very it, it's pretty fascinating. You know, Sid Barrett always had very interesting uh, rhythmic sensibilities. I remember reading about this how you know the the musicians that had been gathered around Barrett to record this soon realized it was impossible to play with him, and so from what I understand, what they did is they got Barrett to kind of strum his acoustic guitar and his very unique rhythm rhythms and sing the songs and then later the you know have those tracks and then the band would come in you know kind of directed by david gilmore mostly from what i understand band would come in and sort of fill in the tracks <laughs> you know because it was impossible to kind of play together with him but uh you know his unique sensibilities are all over these songs terrapin dark globe which gilmore would later you know uh cover <laughs> on his, uh, his some of his solo shows way way later uh, octopus i think is great that would, that would have made a great pink floyd song late night is, is suitably spooky but yeah it's just a you know I, I mean it's a fascinating sort of psych folk weird record but very good all right <laughs> moving in a totally different direction from my third one here this, now, this is a sleeper. This is one that a lot of you guys probably didn't know existed. You guys know I'm a pretty big fan of Duran Duran. I think that, you know, and, and if you go back and watch our Duran Duran video, we talk about the spinoff groups anyway, Arcadia and Power Station. That's not what I'm doing here. I, you know, I, I think the key to Duran Duran is in their secret weapon in some ways that they're actually all very good musicians. Like really, you know, John Taylor on bass, of course. And out of that original lineup, um, yeah, yeah, Andy Summers. Andy Summers. <laughs> What's the police? Andy Taylor. <laughs> Andy Taylor on guitar. You, you'll see in a second why I mentioned Andy Summers. Andy Taylor on guitar. And his solo debut, Thunder, is actually really, really good. You know, <laughs> there he is in his rock god guitar glory right there in the mountains. Um, you know, one of the main reasons, you know, from what I understand, that Power Station was formed as a little side project with uh, John Taylor and, and, and Andy Taylor uh, and Robert Palmer and Tony Thompson um, was that 
John Taylor, the bassist, didn't think that Duran Duran really featured enough of Andy Taylor's awesome guitar. You know, I mean, you know, they weren't like a guitar focused band, although his guitar playing with Duran Duran is fantastic. But, um, but a lot of it's rhythmic and kind of more subtle. Yeah, he didn't really let loose on solos and, you know, a lot of distortion and that kind of thing on the Duran Duran material. And so you get that a lot on the power station stuff, and you get that a lot here. I mean, he really kind of lets loose his, you know, sort of kind of, you know, guitar rock, but really good, especially the first side. The first side, I mean, is solid all the way through. I Might Lie was sort of a you know, minor hit off of here, but Don't Let Me Die Young, Life Goes On, Thunder, the title track. That first side is solid all the way through. Second side's a little, a little less consistent, although it ends on a wonderful uh, instrumental called French Guitar, which is fantastic. So yeah, this is this is this is great because it really features Andy Taylor's uh, guitar playing that, that may, you know, at least a side of his guitar playing that maybe wasn't featured on, you know, the, those Duran Duran records. That, that just wasn't their direction. All right, so these last two are related uh, because they are both little side projects of two members of a huge band that was still going at the time. And as uh, the police, which is, explains why I confused Andy Taylor, Andy Summers a second ago, because one of these records is involves Andy Summers. Uh, but I'll start with the one that involves Stuart Copeland. Now, you know, it's hard to say anything that Sting put out would be a cult thing because he had huge success. But, you know, Stuart Copeland and Andy Summers did a lot of great work also away from the police that didn't get nearly as much attention, of course. You know, as Sting's material did. So we're going to start with a Stuart Copeland's solo debut, which actually came out in 1980, like while the police were a huge thing, you know, right in the middle, you know, like around Zenyatta Mandata, that, you know, the third of their five albums, uh, same year. This is 1980. And this is sort of a kind of a legendary uh, release um, under the pseudonym Clark Kent. All right, uh, Clark Kent, you know, and it says here on the spine, right, Clark Kent, music madness from the kinetic kid. And he even created this alter ego with this ridiculous fictional biography back here. Very Stuart Copeland, you know, if you know his sense of humor and everything, uh, you know, if you, you read this and these songs. And so this is an interesting story. So Copeland had this song, uh, Don't Care. Which, is, which opens it. Now, this is uh, the 10 inch, I believe. And so you actually take it out, and it's, you know, it's, and you, you can see there's a very uh, poorly disguised Stuart Copeland right there. <laughs> but um, yeah, Clark Kent. And, and he had this song, Don't Care. And he thought it had a lot of potential. He, he wanted it for the police. Sting tried it, couldn't relate to it, couldn't really sing it, it and so they kind of set it aside. And, but Copeland still thought, this, this, this is a good song. And so that was kind of the genesis of this. And then, you know, over, I think that was like 78 when he had written Don't Care, you know, it was early days of the police. And then, you know, over the next couple of years, you know, a couple more songs, and he had enough for this basic, you know, EP. And so that's what this is. But the police were really, really rising. He didn't want to distract from the success of the police, so he creates this kind of ridiculous, you know, uh, disguise, pseudonym, whatever, Clark Kent. They even performed, like Andy Summers and Sting backing up Stuart Copeland, everyone in masks, you know, performed as Clark Kent occasionally. Anyway, the music on here is fun. It's very Stuart Copeland. You know, if you think of Stuart Copeland, like Stuart Copeland written police songs, like, uh, um, you know, on any other day, or uh, Miss Gradenko, or, or even some of the instrumentals that he wrote for the police. You know, like Other Way of Stopping, very similar. You know, very, very similar. You know, and 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 it is cool that it's, it's very much a one man band thing. Copeland plays everything on here: the guitars, the bass, the drums, of course, uh, the you know the vocals, the piano. It, it, every, everything is played by Copeland on here. So that, that's pretty cool. Anyway. I'm a big Stuart Copeland, Copeland fan, so this is fun. I know recently, I think it was for Record Store Day, maybe? Recently, this got kind of a deluxe uh, edition release, which I, I don't have. I haven't heard. This is just you know, 
the original EP, but anyway, it's fun, especially if you're kind of a Stuart Copeland fan and you like those sort of quirky, off-kilter Copeland tracks from the police, right? It, right along that those lines. Finally, as I mentioned, Andy Summers. Now, this came out in 82, and this is I Advance Masked. It's a, it's a, uh, a collaboration between Andy Summers and Robert Fripp, which is interesting because, you know, this is 82, so the police are still going strong, and this is right in the middle of that 80s edition of King Crimson that Robert Fripp's, you know, obviously involved in, and there's, there's Fripp and there's Andy Summers. And so while all that's going on, they kind of got together and did this little side album. And, you know, if you think about it, the, the, the sort of the both both guitar players, Fripp and Andy Summers, very into sort of atmospherics and, uh, and mood. I mean, both can play you know, incredibly well uh, technically, but they often, you know, sort of sort of maybe pull back on that a little bit in favor of kind of atmospherics and such. And this record is definitely along there. Now, if you listen carefully, you hear some awesome playing. Uh, but a lot of it is, you know, is focused on those atmospherics. And, you know, if you think of what's going on with King Crimson, sort of the, the guitar interplay between Fripp and Adrian Ballou and King Crimson at the time, you know, the 80s edition of King Crimson, a lot of that same feel is sort of reproduced here with Andy Summers. Kind of this very intricate, interesting guitar interplay between the two. And if you think about it, I mean, you know, with, with kind of both of their innovative styles, um, they would mesh pretty well. And they do here. They put out one one more record after this, which I don't, I don't think is as good. But this is pretty much all instrumental, and it's really, really good. Um, it's not all, you know, ambient atmospherics. I mean, there's you know, there's there's drums and there's you know, so, so I mean, some of these songs drive pretty well too, but just Great, great instrumental music, you know, from, from these two masters. And it's kind of interesting, you know, it says, similar with the uh, Stuart Copeland, it says, all instruments played by Andy Summers and Robert Fripp. So, you know, the, uh, you know, they do all the percussion, all the bass, all the synthesizers, as well as all the guitars, so the two of them, basically. So, really interesting collaboration. So, very cool. All right. Well, there's my latest five for... Uh, for uh, occult albums. Anyway, have you heard some of these? What do you think of them? What are some you know other suggestions you have along these lines? Let's stick with the theme, like interesting you know, side projects or solo records after someone left like a bigger band, but that wasn't huge in its own right, like say Sting's solo albums or something. But uh, you know they you know, might qualify as cult albums. Let's just talk along those lines in the comments. Anyway, thanks for uh, watching. Please do subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Like the videos. All that stuff helps us out. And we'll see you next time on Amity Tracks.